A warm welcome to the October 2021 episode of the Uxbridge FM podcast. Coming up this month, we find out about the Halloween plans for Uxbridge, catch up with half-term activities at the Iver Environment Centre, get our gym kit on at the Hillingdon Leisure Centre, we'll hear about what was found at Cranford Park, there's an update from the fire station, a new newspaper for the borough, and grab some gardening gloves too. First off, Kira Gibson dropped by from the Uxbridge Business Improvement District. She's a big fan of Halloween. Halloween is just the absolute best and I inflict it on everybody else in the vid office. So uh, this year we thought we'd do something slightly different. We're doing a Love Uxbridge Halloween Spooktacular. I know, drum roll please. Everything's kicking off on Friday the 29th of October. And we've got a food market coming back in. So some of our favourites from the summer are joining us again. And that will be running the Friday the 29th, Saturday the 30th and Sunday the 31st of October from 10am to 6pm. And then also on the Friday, we've got pumpkin carving between 10am and 3pm that you can book via our website because it's all free, but you just have to reserve a space. Uh, And we've also got sand art so you can make sort of skull candy sand art it's really cool coming back in they'll also be in 10 on 3 uh, and we've got the, the amazing birds of prey coming back as well between 10 and 3 doing a harry potter theme oh i love the birds of prey yeah lots of owls and you know dressed up can't wait and then saturday the 30th of october we're doing something slightly different never been done before in uxbridge so obviously we've got the food market running we've got pumpkin carving again 10 on 3 the birds of prey and the sand art 10 on 3 But then at five o'clock, the witching hour starts and uh, we've got Halloween performers, a 50 piece samba band coming in, covered in LED lights, Ah. skull candies, walking around on stilts. I've got skeleton heads. We've got voodoo witch doctors. We've got fire performers, the Day of the Dead candy skull girls as well. Wow, that'd be amazing. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. I can't wait. (laughs) Uh, And again, all free, all in Uxbridge Town Centre based sort of around near in front of the pavilions uh, and the train station, Mm. nice and central. So, yeah, it's just going to be so much fun. And they'll be performing until about eight o'clock and the samba band will be in playing. And it's just that amazing, all the drums and everything, particularly on a cold, spooky night. It will just be incredible. So So praying for a bit of fog to come down. Definitely. No rain. No rain. Just a little bit of fog (laughs) would be nice. If not, it would be me there with some dry ice. Dry ice, yes. (laughs) And then Halloween itself, Sunday the 31st of October, we've got uh, obviously our amazing food traders in between 10 and 5. And then we've got uh, movies in Fastenage Park. Ah, this is new. Yes. So 1 o'clock, we've got Adam's Family, 3 o'clock, Hocus Pocus, and 7 o'clock, Beetlejuice. Fantastic. There is a charge for that one, and it's £5 for adults and £3 for kids, but all proceeds go to the Mayor's Fund. Uh, ah. which is an amazing cause. Uh, and the charity this year, I believe, is Hillingdon Women's Aid. We can't wait to sort of support such an amazing cause. There's 100 tickets per showing. So you come in. I ordered the chairs yesterday uh, as hay bales were proving problematic. You just sit, you enjoy, you, know, you can bring snacks and the rusty bike will be open doing amazing hot chocolate oh, and wow. lovely things. And yeah, it'd just be great fun and... There'll be gazebos up, so you'll be protected in case our British weather decides to be on top form. And you can book all of it through our website, which is www.loveuxbridge.co.uk forward slash events. This is great because I think Fastenage Park is underused, isn't it, as a resource? It's great that you're using the park. So, Because it's such a wonderful resource there. It's a beautiful park. It's a great place. It's so close to the town centre. Literally a two-minute walk from my office, which is just around the corner, two-minute walk down from Windsor Street, where we are now, and a two-minute walk from the pavilion. So yeah. you, you can park up, come in, go, you know, grab your pick-a-mix or grab a nice bite to eat from one of our amazing eateries or bars or yeah. go watch the film, then, you know. I'm thinking there'll be some fog coming off the river as well over the park. Oh, I hope That'll so. That would be nice. That would be so cool. <laughs> I'd love it. <laughs> It'd be amazing. Wow, so Halloween's going to be great. Yes, can't wait. And I'd love it if people dressed up. So we will be dressing up. All the traders will be dressing up. It will just be so much fun. So, yeah, if you're coming in, please dress up. 
doesn't matter, young, old, whatever, dress up and have fun with it. Because we tend to sort of hide in our house in Halloween, pull the <laughs> no. lights off. So uh, we're no. definitely coming to Uxbridge rather than being in the house Dude, yeah. away from trick-or-treaters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's Halloween. And um, I'm not sure if I could ask you about Christmas. Is it top secret still? No. Or have you got any ideas well, in the pipeline for Christmas? It's not, comp- it's slightly top secret, but I'll give you a, a sneak peek. <laughs> well, Christmas starts on the 20th of November. Of course. Which is our Christmas light switch on. So Saturday, the 20th of November, the Christmas market will be in situ. It's going to be bigger and better than ever. We may or may not have animatronic reindeer that sing. Okay. And you can have really cool photo opportunities with. They are so cool. Our stage will be back in just amazing Christmas traders, you know, sort of far flung and local. Lovely, beautiful little chalets will be back in. All the Christmas lights are going to be up. What we're not putting on top of the train station roof this year, it's going to be very cool. Might be adding polar bears to my sort of amazing winter wonderland on top of the station. And we're putting in more lights than we've ever had. It's just, you're going to see Uxbridge from the International Space Station is my aim. Are you sort of abseiling back down the station once you've put your polar bears up and everything? Well, I mean, if anybody sees me and I'm falling off, then it's it's not intentional. <laughs> no, no. I imagine your contacts book's quite interesting. You've probably got like uh, reindeers under R yeah. and yeah. then um, samba dancers under S. <laughs> That's quite interesting selection of contacts I, probably. It probably is. Anybody had my phone, they'd probably think, my goodness, what does this... I'll do for a living. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, last year we ordered five penguins and one wound up in Glasgow. We still don't know where it is. Ah. I like to think he had a nice life, you know. It's probably colder there for him, though. Well, this is it, you know, set up a fish and chip shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I'm looking forward to Halloween and then, um, yeah, a bit yeah. of a and then sneak the, peek of Christmas the, there. Sit, when the lights switch on again on the 20th, we're going to have fireworks back in. So ah, the fireworks yeah. will be going off. I've got some incredible performers I mean, we may or may not have a woman in a giant roaming snow globe. Yeah. We may or may not have LED fairies running around, uh, snow lion and red queen. Okay. You know, ice king and queen on stilts. Just so many cool things coming in. That's just for the 20th. Uh, And then every Saturday moving forward, we've got live music and bands and, yeah, everything. So every Saturday in Uxbridge is just going to be so much fun from the 20th of November. Uh, and the Sunday, we've got the Birds of Prey coming back in as well because people just love them so much. Yeah. So. Well, my tip on the 20th of November is definitely book a table yes. in one of the restaurants definitely. just afterwards now because they'll probably uh, They're book gonna out, so won't they? Up. This is yeah. it. Pick your favourite restaurant or pub, book a table for about, I reckon, half six, quarter to seven. Yeah. And, yeah, go in and, and keep it local, support our local shops and yeah. our eateries and our pubs and our restaurants and... Yeah, enjoy their amazing Christmas menus. and. I'll ask the council if they can just close the road up from the uh, Civic Centre for you down to Vine Street. That'll be fine, won't it? <laughs> yeah, that'll be. Pull the seats out and some restaurants. Yeah, like, that's it. We'll like France or exactly. Spain or somewhere. Yeah, go full on sort of European eating. That would be yeah. amazing. Oh, thanks, Kira. This is great. So dates for the diary there. We'll um, put those in the show notes, yeah. all those dates. And uh, Halloween is going to be great. Yes, Halloween and Christmas are going to yes. just be absolutely amazing. So, And do you want people to help out? I mean, if you've got like um, someone wants to volunteer to help you out and set up things, would that be something useful? Do yeah, they get to wear a yellow fluorescent jacket? <laughs> Normally I have uh, two phones, uh, a megaphone, a walkie-talkie, high vis and something else. So <laughs> I'm always quite easily, easy to spot. Um, yeah. If anybody or just wants more information, is interested in, in sort of anything that I've said, just drop me an email. It's Kira, K-I-R-A, at UxbridgeBid.com. Well, thanks, Kira, for popping in and telling us all about Halloween and Christmas. Now, what's your plan for half term with the kids? That's the question. Well, Cathy Simpson is Education Officer at Ivor Environment Centre. Cathy, what's happening over there at half term? We've got family fun days on Monday the 25th and Friday the 29th, morning and afternoon sessions on both those days. And then on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we've got drop-off sessions for 7 to 11-year-olds. And what's the idea of those, apart from getting rid of your kids? Well, we're going to have a sort of autumnal and Halloween-y theme to both sets of events, with the older children at the drop-off days, it's going to be a, a wide game and pumpkin carving. During the wide game, they're going to have to find all the equipment for the next activity. And we've got lots of outdoorsy stuff going on. 
And obviously, at this time of year, there's a Halloween theme, but being an environment centre, we're trying to keep nature to the forefront as well. And then hopefully from November, we're going to start up um, community access on Mondays, which is going to be um, alternate weeks for early years and anyone. Thanks, Cathy. And the website is iverenvironmentcentre.org. Now, if you're listening last month, you might recall we spoke to Bob Barton from the Cranford Park Friends. They were about to have an archaeological dig. Let's catch up with Bob and find out what was found. Well, we found a lot. It's been the biggest archaeological dig we've ever had in Cranford Park, and we've had several. This lasted three weeks, and uh, we were led by experts from AOC Archaeology, and we had... Over 60 people helping. I don't know where to start, actually. Some of the bigger things, we found the actual entrance, stone entrance porch to the Barclay House. Uh, Just to explain, there was a big house there owned by the Earls of Barclay, which is one of the richest families in the country at the time. A huge house, sadly all demolished now, but we've found the entrance porchway, including the, the rings where two stone columns stood either side of the main door. There were also two bay windows in the house, huge bay windows going up three stories, and we found the, the foundations for one of these. But perhaps more exciting is we found a wall of an earlier house, The Barclay House was from the 18th century, but we found a house that we believe was part of the house belonging to Sir Roger Aston, who's one of the important courtiers of King James I's government. This is uh, Tudor brickwork, and very exciting. Everyone's really overjoyed to find this, and probably we found footings of an even earlier house. So it just goes to show that this site in Cranford Park was an important place of residence for people going back many more centuries than we thought. And does that change what you can build on top of it now, or is it, is it all still going ahead? Oh, it will still go ahead. I mean, all the, um, the dig sites have been covered over now to protect them, and the building will go ahead probably starting early in the new year. But we've found lots of individual items that have been taken away for analysis. I can tell you something about those. And again, these individual items go back many centuries, including Kingston-type ware, fragments of uh, of bowls that date from the late medieval period, and also uh, 16th century floor tiling in green glaze, beautiful objects dating from, from Tudor times. And then late 16th century bases of jars and jugs, china and porcelain, obviously all broken, but The experts can analyse this and pinpoint almost to the exact kiln that these places were made. There was quite a lot of what is known as Kingston-type ware, which was made in various kilns in Surrey in the late medieval period. So these are quite important. And uh, more recently, one of uh, our searchers found a threepenny piece, a pre-decimal threepenny piece dated 1942. And the house was demolished just after the Second World War. So we think that that was possibly dropped by one of the workmen who was working on demolishing the old house. So it's definitely a site of um, important historical interest, which is, is interesting in, in over many years. Yes. And, and in fact, we'll be continuing with further digs in future years as part of our National Lottery project. So though the house site will be the site for our new cafe, as you mentioned, we're going to be extending trenches in future years to dig and find more of this medieval house. Again, local people will be very welcome to come and help us. So just to recap, when does the Cafe and Toilets project start and when is it forecast to, to finish by? The building work will, uh, will start early in the new year and it will last for about 11 months. And it's going to cover the main courtyard area because we're also going to be uh, restoring the cellars of the old house, which still exist. And this will be an important part of the uh, new park's offering. We'll also be installing visitor centre in the the old Barclay stables and putting in tracks and trails around the park. So there's there's a lot to happen, but that will be happening during um, the early part of next year. But the park will still be open and we'll be still be continuing with our volunteer activities and as many events as we can do under those circumstances. It's all very exciting. Well, thanks, Bob, for yeah. updating us on the dig. 
And um, we look forward to those toilets and cafes being built late next year now, I suppose, won't it? We'll keep you posted. Yeah. And people can, if people are interested in, in our group, Cranford Park Friends, they can have a look on our website, which is cranfordparkfriends.org. Now, if you've not been to the Hillingdon Sports and Leisure Centre since lockdown, there's been a few changes. I popped down and spoke to Chris Parker and Carly Oatesway, General Manager and Assistant Manager at the centre, to find out, first of all, about the history of the centre and then about what's changed. Originally, this is a 1935 Lido and it was open um, for, for quite a long period of time and then they had a bit of downtime where they shut then it was reopened around 2012 but they then added the the main part to the building as well mm-hmm. and about four years prior to that the athletic stadium was was built so originally it was the lido then the athletic stadium was built which was opened by the queen and then we opened the the main building around 2012. i walked in and there were some bonkers people in the outdoor lido because so i gather now it's actually heated that's right so We've been working in partnership with Hillenden Council. The end of August, we managed to get the outdoor Lido heated, so it's now running at 23 degrees. We're trying to attract a new uh, a new clientele. At the moment, we're getting probably about 60 to 80 people using it, considering it's it's 12, 13, 14 degrees outside. But in the summer months, um, it's particularly busy with four, or 500 people using it. And I gather the Lido is actually carbon neutral. Yeah, so when we were working in partnership with Hillenden Council, part of the requirements were to make sure that the heating system was carbon neutral. So we now use green gas, green electricity, and then we have a, a two-year plan in place to be able to then install either solar panels um, or heat pumps. A little tuck shop as well, is that new outside? So originally pre-COVID, we used to have a cafe inside the centre, but with COVID restrictions, we weren't allowed any dwell time. So we opened up a, uh, a small tuck shop just outside the Lido and we were selling um, teas, coffees, ice creams just so that the customers that are coming into the centre had an option for refreshments. And what else is new since COVID? You haven't been for a while. What else is new in the centre? I think the biggest change has been um, the launch of our app. Pre-COVID, you used to walk into the centre and you had uh, multiple reception staff waiting to take their bookings. And now what we've got is a, an app that you use before you arrive. So um, you do all your bookings um, before you turn up. And I guess the advantage is that you know what space you've got, you know what time your booking is. There's no hanging around, no queues, no waiting. The usual sort of 3G pitches as well, at the back of the centre as well. So people have, who haven't been to Hillenden Complex before, it's, um, it's a very big facility. So we've got um, the free 3G pitches outside. We've also got um, the Athletics Track and Stadium. So we've got Hilden Athletics Club who operate from there on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. The long-term plan is to start developing that and start having other days out there. And then within the centre, we've got the heated outdoor 50-metre Lido. Uh, we've also got the indoor 50-metre competition pool. We've got the children's leisure pool. And then obviously we've got the gym, we've got the sports hall and we've got all our studios for all our group exercise classes. Let's chat about the app then, shall we? So the app that's just been launched, everybody has to book. Is that the plan? You have to book the um, sessions before you come in. And that's great for, I suppose, COVID, isn't it? Because it keeps people segregated. You know everybody's coming in. And also, as you were saying, you can, if anything's cancelled, you can just ring them all up and say it's cancelled or whatever. How's the app going? The app's going really well. Um, it's, it's a good addition to what we have. Customers, I think, are finding it quite straightforward. It is very customer user friendly as well. We've got staff on site that are helping customers if they are having difficulties. So it is good because they get to look seven days in advance. They can book seven days in advance if they're a member. They can book onto their classes, whether it be for, you know, the group cycle, if they want to go for a swim or if they want to do anything else that we have on offer in the centre, they can just pre-book it. There's no worry about queuing up at reception. And the app's called... Better UK, it's free. You can get it on um, your app store. So whether you've got an Android or if you've got an Apple phone, it's there. And it really is quite easy to use. You just choose your centre and then dial in, swim or gym or whatever. Definitely. I mean, you've downloaded the app as well. So it's quite straightforward. Um, Even I can do it. Yeah, even you can do it. (laughs) So it's quite straightforward. And you just choose the centre and then you just choose the activity of your choice. And then you would create like a barcode. And then once you come into the centre, that's what gives you access through our turnstiles. Yeah. 
There's lots of um, possible sort of discounts and things, aren't there? If you've got a um, Hillingdon card or you've an old person, what, what sort of discounts are there? So we've got different um, pricing structures. So if you're a resident, you get a reduced fee, but we also do off-peak and peak times as well. Oh, right. So if you come in before, say, nine o'clock, then you would obviously get a different price than after nine o'clock. Okay. I think the key thing with the pricing is um, that you do have to have a membership or a pay-and-play membership linked to it. So um, if you wanted to be a customer who just wanted to pay as and when they turned up, we still need to have a pay and play membership because that will, is what gives you the discount prices. And again, if you're a resident or a non-resident, you still have to apply for that membership. So it's very simple. You just go onto our website, uh, Better UK, Join Now. And there's a button that you click for Join Now. And then you just put into your details of what membership type you want. So as I said, if it's pay and play or if it's a prepaid membership where you pay a monthly fee, that generates a barcode number or a membership number for you and you link that to your app. And it's important that's done because if you don't do that, you'll get the higher prices mm. or the non-resident prices because it'll automatically be set up for non-resident prices. I see. So uh, a really important thing is just make sure that you do get the um, set your membership up first and then link it to your, uh, to your app. Not everyone has access to apps, so um, we do have the ability to book online on the computer. So if you don't have a phone, you can do it on a desktop. And then failing that, if you don't have a desktop, then you can come into the centre and you can book in advance at the centre. The advantage of the app is that you can pre-book and you know that you've got guaranteed spaces. Obviously, without pre-booking, there's a chance that facility is already full. Do try book in advance and you can book seven days in advance for all your activities. Great stuff. Thanks for chatting to us today, Chris and Carly. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I bet you didn't know there's a brand new newspaper in the borough. Let's find out more about that. Right, Rachel Sharp is here. Hi, Rachel. Hello, Steve. Thank you very much for having me. And you are Senior Journalism Lecturer at Brunel University. Yeah. And I think big congratulations are in order for launching a brand new local newspaper for Hillingdon, the Hillingdon Herald. Yeah, I guess you can relax for a bit now. You've had the launch party last night. Uh, the mayor was there, John McDonald, an MP for Hayes and Harlington. So how has it been setting up a, a brand new newspaper? It has been an absolute pleasure, actually. It was so much fun. I know I'm probably a bit of a glutton for punishment, but it really was a labour of love for me, and I'm not just saying that. I've been in newspapers most of my life, particularly local newspapers. That's all I've ever specialised in, and I absolutely love it. So it's been a lot of fun. The party last night was amazing. I am shattered this morning, but that's <laughs> fine. I'll deal with that. It was lovely. There was a lot of love at the launch last night and a lot of people saying that they were very happy to see something in print for a change. And, you know, I think that was the reason behind it. It was everybody's so involved in social media these days and websites, which of course is really important, but it is a bit of a lost art, a, a printed product for people to look at. I hope people really like it. There will always be those people that stay away from printed newspapers, but hopefully some people will like it. And it's, it's uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun, a lot of hard work, but loads of fun. I suppose from a student's perspective, there's nothing like producing a real newspaper to teach them the sort of pressure of real life, print journalism, <laughs> deadlines. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Actually, it was really, really funny on deadline because we were so busy trying to get the pages to the printers on time and the students were kind of looking at us in absolute amazement. It was the first time, I think it was probably the first time they'd ever seen me look under pressure because I'm normally very cool and calm and collected in lectures. And all of a sudden I was running my hands through my hair and shouting, where's this picture? Who's got this? Who's got that? And they were laughing. They couldn't believe how funny it was, but they were amazing. They just kept coming up to me and saying, I'll get you a coffee, Rachel. Do you want something to eat? Is everything okay? Can I help? But yeah, real experience them to see what it's actually like working to pressure to deadline, but great learning experience for them to see it in, in real life. And how big is the team behind the newspaper? So at the moment, the founding members were our master's students who are studying master's in international journalism. So we have 12 students there and then myself, Steve Cohen, who's our head of news, and Beowulf Mayfield, we call him Wolfie. He is our sub-editor. But now that term has started and we have the first years, the second years and the third years and a new group of masters, everybody in the journalism team will be involved. So just over the summer, it was just our master students because they were the only ones on campus. But yeah, now that uh, term has properly started and we're full up at university again, it will be everybody. So there's no adverts in the paper. How is it funded? 
Well, Bridal University have been very kind and they are funding our first few editions for us. But obviously we all know that local papers can't survive without advertising. So that is our next huge challenge. Um, But we're obviously up for it and we're going to do everything we can. So we're going to be starting that campaign after Christmas and we're going to start targeting, as you know, as an editor, I can't be any part of the advertising. I have to be completely separate, but we will be. The university does plan to get funding in place and we're hopefully starting that after Christmas. So fingers crossed. What I would like to do actually is target the local businesses um, because lots of uh, newspapers in the past have gone for the big adverts and, you know, lots of money. Uh, and the big supermarkets and things advertising. But, you know, what about giving publicity to our little bookshops and our little local shops and and corner shops and things like that? I think that's really, really important to support local business. Um, So hopefully they'll be able to support us. We'll have to see. Is it difficult with um, how students transition? I mean, they come and go, don't they? How will you keep the team motivated going forward? It is quite hard, actually. And we have thought about that a lot. So our master's students at the moment, they are the editors of particular sections. So we've got a political editor, we've got a sports editor. So what we're doing now, now that the first, second and third years have come in, they are talking to our editors, the master students, and they're passing down their knowledge to them. So when the master students leave in January, we'll appoint a new political editor and a new sports editor and so on from the new cohort. And then they will have two or three years and then they will pass the baton along. So yes, there will be a change of students all the time, but we do plan to have a very good handover process. So the students at the moment that will eventually be the editors are working with our section editors now. So hopefully they'll get, and it's great for the students because they get experience from other students. So master Mm. students have quite a lot of knowledge, obviously, and they're passing that down to third years and the third years have more experience than the first years. So they're passing that down. So it's working really well at the moment. I'm just, you know, I'm really pleased with it. I don't want to be cruel to our um, local papers that are called, inverted commas, local, but what do you think's happened in terms of local print journalism? What's been the downfall of it? I think it's been very sad. Local print journalism, it's all about not having enough money and it's all about companies squeezing people out. So for myself, I was, before I started teaching at Brunel, I was an editor of seven Uh, newspapers in London, local London papers. And when I became editor, I would have sort of four or five reporters for each area. And then, of course, what happens is one of them leaves and then they tell you you can't replace them. And then another one leaves and then they tell you you can't replace them. So I had poor reporters, you know, working in my office based in Hendon that were covering a patch 20 miles away on their own. And it's not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. And people were selling their offices and moving away, moving out of the area And that's tragic because one of the most important things, I think, for local journalism is you have to know your area. Mm. You have to be based in the area. You have to understand the people, the businesses, the shops, the events. And, you know, you, you just don't get that anymore. And I think that has been one of the downfalls. You cannot be working in a newsroom 20 miles away and know your community. Mm. Um, And it's sad, it's tragic. I mean, I feel very bad for a lot of the reporters and journalists because I know many of them in the local papers. And, you know, I'm sure they're as sad as we are that, you know, they they can't do the job they really want to do. Let's face it, journalism is a passion, isn't it? It's not something that you choose to go into for the money. (laughs) We all know that. But it is a vocation. And so people that work in journalism want to do it. And it's not their fault that these things have been squeezed. So uh, it's a real shame. And it is hard, isn't it, to get hold of what is the truth these days. We're all on Facebook and Twitter every day. And obviously an article written in a newspaper is written by a journalist. It's fact-checked and there'll be a source, whereas on Twitter anybody can post whatever they like. So um, I think a lot of people just assume Facebook is true. Um, It's difficult, isn't it, when you're trying to break through that? I think it's exactly that. It is interesting because so many of my own friends and family have said, oh, did you hear about this? And I and I always say, well, where did you hear that? What's the source? Yeah. You know, that's not news. And people talk about fake news. And something that really upsets me is they talk about fake news and, and fake journalists and they say, oh, all news is rubbish. It's all fake. It's not. What they're talking about that they think is news is social media. Mm. Social media is not news. So obviously my students know that even if they see a tweet, they don't retweet it. They fact check it. Then they look into it, see if it's true. And then they'll write a story about it. 
So it's disappointing. A lot of people talk about the news being fake and, and they don't mean news. They mean social media. And, and I think we need to try and move away from that. And people need to understand proper journalism. You know, our students are trained in everything for obviously news writing. They have to write shorthand. They have to take shorthand notes. They're trained in public affairs. They had to report on, on politics and they're trained in media law. Mm. So all the people that you see on Twitter and Facebook and, you know, wherever, they don't know their media law. They don't know what they're saying is true. It's not fact-checked and it's quite frankly dangerous. So, so yeah, very frustrating. It's quite easy to libel somebody, isn't it, if you're not careful, I suppose. Very easy, particularly for people on Twitter. I mean, I, I really do think there should be a lot more curbs on social media. I think it should be... I understand social media has its place. I love social media. We all do. But it, yeah, it's very easy. People don't understand how easily they can libel somebody on Twitter and they could land themselves in huge trouble. The media has um, a lot of power, doesn't it? I think it's probably come across through the a couple of incidents locally, which was the petrol crisis. And there's a one that's brewing at the moment. Um, don't worry, there's lots of Christmas presents <laughs> coming. Don't panic, buy toys, which is the worst thing you can say, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, but I, I was really impressed by the article in the paper. There's a piece on refugees coming across and the media was saying, oh, it's, a, it's an influx, it's, it's chaos, it's a crisis. <laughs> and one of your reporters has obviously gone down and found the source mm. of that, which is great reporting. We should be seeing a lot more of that, I think, finding the source of stories. Thank you. Yes, it's it's really important to the students and they are very, very dedicated, very passionate and they want to do things right. So one of the things that I often say, I mean, I don't wish to disrespect any media outlet really, but I do tend to say to my students, if you see something in the paper that says a source said, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> so name your sources, find your sources, back them up. And, and we have a policy that it's a minimum two source rule. You know, you have to get two sources on everything. And so, yeah, thank you for pointing that out, because I agree, you know, actually finding the real story, because the mainstream media has been accused and, you know, very often quite rightly of inflating stories. And it's not the real world and it's not the truth. And I know I may sound old fashioned, but, you know, I became a journalist because I wanted to be a truth seeker. I want people to know what's actually going on. The bit for, um, you know, just to get extra likes and just sound bites for people to look at. That's not, it's just not journalism and, and it's a shame. So you're right, the petrol crisis has been one of the big ones that's uh, been all over the place recently. And, and a lot of people have blamed social media for that. They're saying the press are blowing it out of proportion. Well, actually, if you look at Twitter, that's the one that's going crazy. Mm. Where can we get hold of the Hillingdon Herald? Well, if anybody would like to stock the Hillingdon Herald, we would actually love to hear from them. This is obviously our first edition, so we are, at the moment, it is being distributed to some homes in, we picked some postcodes in Uxbridge and over in Hayes and Harlington. We're trying to spread ourselves as much around the borough as we can with the first edition. We are trying to speak to the council about putting them into local libraries, which we think would be great. Yeah. Lots of people at the launch last night were suggesting that they go into places of worship, of which there are so many around Hillingdon, so that we can reach everybody. So we will be doing that this week. We are putting them into places of worship, hoping to put them into the libraries, delivering to postcodes. We're going to be speaking to local shops, particularly local businesses, proper local businesses, you know, not the big conglomerate businesses, because it is, after all, for local people. And some students are going to be around town handing them out to people as well. So it's Great. free of charge. If you pick one up, leave it on the tube if you like to. And then maybe somebody else will pick it up and pass it on. And then by next month, uh, hopefully we should have some more details on exactly where people can collect it. But yes, uh, local libraries, shops, businesses, or some schools as well. Uxbridge High School, I believe, are taking some and Uxbridge College as well. So we can definitely let you know where people can pick it up for the next month's edition. And to contact the newspaper, is there a, an email or a website or Twitter? There is. There is an email address. So our main news emailed address is hillingdonherald at brunel.ac.uk. You can contact me, Rachel Sharp, as the editor, which is rachel.sharp at brunel.ac.uk. And we also have a Twitter and Instagram we don't have Facebook because my students tell me that only very old people use Facebook these days. Oh, is that true? Apparently. I'm on Facebook. So, I know, yeah. me too, but don't tell them I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rachel, for popping in, telling us all about this brand new paper. Congratulations. That's thank great. you. And thank you very much for having me. And next up, blue lights on, sirens sounding. We're off to the fire station. Right, so we've come to Hillingdon Fire Station. 
and very kind invitation from station commander Glenn Nicolades. He's going to tell us a bit about what the fire service gets up to and hopefully give us a tour around the fire station. So Glenn, maybe just starting off, how many fire stations are there in Hillingdon? We've got Ryslip, which is the most north, and then as you would travel down south, you would then come to Hillingdon, yeah. which is on the Uxbridge Road where we are now. And then slightly left, if you're looking at a map, you'd have Hayes, yeah. which is just above Heathrow. And then going down even more, where people forget about, is you've got Heathrow. You can actually see the Northern Runway from the fire station. There's also a station within Heathrow as well. So we do a lot of joint working with them. Obviously, the question that everybody asks is, when you're not going to a fire, what are you doing in the fire station? Funny enough, it's not in the fire station. We do most of our work these days. Ah. So at the fire station, we will do what we call standard routines, which is testing the old fashioned, testing the equipment and making sure everything is ready for use. We do that on a daily basis. We also do some training, which we've got core skills that we maintain, just simply going up and down a ladder might be, or there may be some stations which have got specialist equipment like water rescue, and they'll be doing that. So now we're doing more and more outward work, which will be going out with the community, meeting either schools, residents, care homes, general public, reaching out to them rather than them coming to us on occasions. And then we will basically do a lot of community safety work and also now regulatory fire safety work, which is a new thing that the fire crews do. But you have to be here in the fire station at certain times, obviously. Um, Not in the fire station, as long as we are available on the ground. So for here, it would be Hillingdon's ground. And then they would be available within that area uh, on a radio on the fire engine. But on the change of shift, they'll need to be back at the fire station as soon as possible to make sure they check all their gear and equipment is available. So what sort of shift pattern? Do you do nights as well? Yeah, so the shift pattern is a four-on, four-off system. Not everyone does that because uh, we're in a modern society now where people have flexible working as well for work-life balance, which can be accounted for, believe it or not. But yeah, we do a four-on, four-off system. So that's two days, two nights, a rest day and three off. And then we do it all again. So it's quite a savage Um, Shift pattern. Yeah, and we basically, sometimes the people uh, will know their watches more than their family. (laughs) Yeah, I suppose, yeah. yeah. And in the fire station, you've got all kinds of exercise stuff and beds and things, so you can do exercises, have a a rest if you want. Yeah, so we've got a full gym here. It's uh, Initially, it was all covered by the welfare fund. We've got our own welfare fund. It's like a charity that we support. And the firefighters... uh, Welfare Fund will supply us with equipment. That's all state-of-the-art now, running machines. You know, when I first joined 22 years ago, uh, not many people went in the gym. It was quite a a gloomy place. Um, Now we've got tellies in there and we've got things to inspire people to go in there and work. We'll see, I mean, when you walk out later, you'll see people in there on a regular basis. Um, And fitness is very important now because we are tested regularly now for our fitness to make sure we're operationally ready. Here at Hillingdon, I regularly go out and actually, even as a senior officer, I'll go out and do exercise with the firefighters. And it could be off-site as well. We do a lot of stuff, actually, regarding fitness. And you can sleep here, I suppose. There's beds and things. Um, I wouldn't call it sleep. Yeah, there are still beds on a fire station. That's a bit of a myth, really. I mean, um, it's more of your resting, awaiting a call. So from midnight, we have our rest period. Um, and that will go till quarter to seven in the morning. But normally we will be out at least two or three times within that period. When, as you can imagine, if you've been woken up at night with children and stuff, you can't get back to sleep. It's virtually impossible. Now, obviously, there's a wide range of call outs that you get. What's mm. the sort of most common ones at the moment in Hillingdon, would you say? Uh, In Hillingdon, um, I would say it's actually society in general that's created this. It's not just Hillingdon. People are struggling to pay their bills. So maintenance of houses have caused electrical issues. People are doing a lot of DIY now, especially post-pandemic. You can see a lot of people have been doing weird and wonderful things with uh, extension leads. Um, And there are some golden rules with uh, electrics, and that's why we have to get them done by a professional We go to a lot of calls now where we've had inappropriate structures being built on back of houses for people to have more living space. What's happened is more and more people have uh, found it difficult to move home for obvious reasons, or we're getting in a crowded city, so 
people have been trying to find their own ways to find accommodation. So that's the sort of calls we get. And obviously now we get a lot more uh, road traffic accidents, especially being in Hillingdon Airport, people coming off their aeroplane, hiring a car, and guess what happens next? <laughs> Wrong side of the road. Mm. Oh, no. So and what about false alarms? How many shouts end up being a false alarm? If we would rewind back probably 10 years, we'd get a lot. Now they're filtered. We do a lot of work on this. We've got this project, it's called Unwanted Fire Signals, and it sounds a bit complicated, but actually what we do is when someone gets a certain amount of false alarms, we will then reach out to them. We'll sort of give them an informal sort of warning and we'll try and help them to reduce their calls. And that may be a simple case of not having an auto dialer if you're a business and having some kind of seek and search system. So you would check there's a fire before the fire brigade would be called. What about barbecues and and things? Barbecues, there is, the golden rule is never leave it unattended. Make sure it's cold before you put it away. And don't like barbecues where there's uh, other properties in the immediate vicinity. So definitely not on a balcony. Even if you think it's solid metal, never do a barbecue on a balcony. That's probably the highest risk is having a barbecue, leaving it unattended. In fact, I had literally one over the weekend where someone had thought they put it away and it was resting up against the shed. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anything with a naked flame or a solid fuel needs to be carefully monitored. And that would mm. be going all the way from barbecue coals, open fires, stoves to fireworks. Yeah. So it's fires, car crashes. Obviously, when there's floods, you're maybe pumping out houses and things. Mm. What other sort of things do you get involved with? When I joined in 2000, we used to go to a lot of fires. Uh, it's not that long ago when you look at the eyes of the 150 years of fire brigade, but we used to go to quite a lot of fires, domestic fires, a lot of the AFAs, uh, automatic fire alarms I was talking about. And we used to do a lot of inspections in nightclubs and stuff, and we used to call them um, events inspections. What's changed recently over the last sort of 10 years, the environment's changed especially on the west side of Hillingdon. We've had a lot of rural floodings, you know, the water level and rain isn't getting drained as efficiently as it as it would have done many years ago because the built environment is now becoming more and more concrete. The water needs to go somewhere. And if it can't go into the ground because of people's driveways are all being paved over, then it goes into the, the normal sewage system and that's when it gets overwhelmed. We're ready for that and we plan for that. And um, as you probably have seen yourself, our equipment we've got to deal with them, we can definitely um, support the public, making sure that their valuables, uh, any medicine and stuff that they need, if they do have a flooding, that we can get in there and uh, get it for them. You wouldn't carry like boats and things here, would you? Uh, Yeah, we have done. Yeah, the nearest one to here would be Heston. So Heston have got a, a water rescue capability where they've got the rib boats, which they inflate. They've got a couple of different systems. They've got paths where they can build an inflatable path. The last time I saw that get used, we um, tried to support and help a whale, a minky whale, down at the lock in Richmond, where they used that system. They're highly trained there, and that's not too far from here. Ireland's quite unique. We've got a lot of neighbouring support. Is there specialisms here in this station? People that are trained have uh, what we call tags. So as well as their them being at the station, they may have specialist training. Like myself, I'm fire safety, so I would go out if there was any sort of um, infringements for fire safety. So although you may not see the equipment at the station, the technical ability of the officers and firefighters, they will have a range. So what about training? The training, you'll be just under 20 weeks training, depending on, on how you get on at training school. That would be your initial training. I'm going back to when I was trained, obviously. And then what that would entail would be everything from how to correctly sweep the floor, <laughs> sounds funny, to uh, actually going into a burning building, a real burning building, and being monitored and watched and assessed of how you would deal with that. So you are assessed in everything that you would possibly do when you come out to be at a station. And then at station, there's two things. You'd have an apprenticeship that you would follow and you'd also have a development, like we call a phase two development, where you'd be actually in post learning the role and then your peers would support you with that. So it's fairly involved. And if you want to be a a firefighter from school, 
What's the sort of um, qualifications you should be looking at? This was exactly how it happened for me. So I, when I joined as a firefighter, I didn't think I was good enough. When I joined, I went for my interview. I remember it clearly as if it was yesterday. And there was people around me with degrees and, uh, you know, which is all this stuff, which is brilliant, you know. But uh, I didn't have those opportunities. You know, I came from uh, a home where there wasn't that much money to invest in me. <laughs> but uh, it didn't stop me, you know. And really, it sounds very straightforward but when you're going to become a firefighter they're looking for your behaviors what you're like as a person your common sense your integrity your drive to do the job and if you're trustworthy because i'm sure if i came in your home we would want someone who's trusted yeah and that's the values really we want people who come to work who value other people and able to be themselves and that is the future of London Fire Brigade, really. We've found that over the years that it's more important the person than actually what they have done in qualifications. But that obviously helps, and there is a minimum requirement, and that changes every year. So some years they'll want a certain academic minimum standard. Other years they'll be looking at a different standard, and it depends on what we have learned as a service over the previous years and what we foresee. So you've got some um, different schemes that can help businesses and help homeowners and things not sure that everybody knows that you can get free smoke alarms Mm. is that a common thing that people know about how do you get a smoke alarm um i mean we say everyone likes something free don't they including myself but the main thing is we offer a package basically and we've done so for many years and it's basically it's a home fire safety visit you would have to approach us or we would ask you unless there was a fire in the vicinity to where you are, we wouldn't knock on your door and cold call. We would only do it if your area is at a risk. What it entails is we would go in as a the whole fire engine, the whole crew, so one fire engine would turn up. We would go in and we would give you advice, and this is based on our experience from firefighting, really. We would give you advice on electrics, naked candle safety, how to do a uh, escape plan. So would you ask you the simple question of what you would do if you were now in a room, how would you make your way out if you didn't know? If maybe you had a disability or you didn't know the layout, then that would be something that you should really plan for. So these are just the simple questions that we would ask. And then at the end of it, we would then assess your dwelling. It would have to be a, a private residence. It couldn't be a business, but we would look at the, resi- the residence. We would give you advice of where to put a smoke alarm and then we would offer you one for free of charge. Okay. And they last for 10 years and they simply just stick up. There's no screws. There's nothing like that. So we would do that for anybody. doesn't matter who you are. You can be in a million pound house or you could be in a tiny small studio bed sit. It's completely irrelevant. That's fully available. For businesses, we do um, fire safety checks now. So we'll go in. uh, That's been going uh, since the beginning of the year. We will go into a small business now, the firefighters again. They'll follow a simple flow chart using their own experience and uh, training. And then they would then look at the the business, do a, a small risk assessment on their operational response. And then they will give you some advice Uh, whether you you need to get a risk assessor or renew your risk assessment if it's needed. And then in worst case scenarios, they will call a senior officer down and then make sure that if there's anyone that's not safe, they are safe. But yeah, we look at a range of stuff now and we offer a lot of free support advice and in situations, smoke alarms, which will include hard of hearing alarms. They sort of have a system where you go under your pillow at night for a vibration. Sometimes we uh, we can sometimes get hold of carbon monoxide alarms. I advise that you have a carbon monoxide alarm anywhere where you have a open fuel. So that would be a open fire stove. And also uh, if you have a, a boiler, probably put it in that room where the boiler is as well. Yeah. And then test it like you would do a smoke alarm. And how much, how much water is in a fire engine? Just under 1,700 litres, about 300 gallon. And it lasts... Usually about, well, if we put on our main jets, it's about three minutes of water, actually. But that's why it's important for us to have working hydrants around the borough, and we test them every year. Mm. What you'll see is as soon as there's a fire at any building, any place, you'll see our firefighters, one of the first things they do is they get two lengths of thick hose and put it straight into the hydrant, Mm. because then we've got a constant supply. 
you'll see us in the summer usually because that's the best time isn't it to walk around the streets you'll see us testing the hydrants making sure they work and any that don't work we put them on a digital system on our fire engines uh, and it's got like a an x marks a spot for the ones that don't work but there's plenty around here so the, the public don't need to worry about that Obviously, because of the recent restrictions, we haven't had many open days or events at the station. That's mm. obviously changing now. Yeah. So please keep an eye on our Twitter account at LFB Hillingdon. And we will always put on there when we're going to do anything. Because there's so much media around now, people get a bit glazed over about yeah. what's going on and things are missed. We also, we've, we've got a drive here, we've got cadets. So we have 14 year olds to 16 year olds where every Wednesday night they come here and do training. And they are basically, their firefighting gear, the helmet, all the equipment, and they do exactly what we do. Just unfortunately don't go out on fires. <laughs> but that's like our initiative that we've got here actually at Hillingdon. There's a couple of places throughout London that do that. So if there's any children out there or parents that think that actually that'd be something interesting to do, all you need to do is go on the internet, type in Firefighter Cadets London and you will find it on Google. And there is a base at Hillingdon. There's a base at Hounslow as well. So if you're not in the borough, that's fine. Um, so that's one of the drives we've got here. The other thing as well is if there's any community events that are happening where they want advice on on fire safety or community safety, please, you know, tweet on our Twitter page or email um, at LFB Hillingdon and we will gladly uh, respond to you. Thanks very much to Station Commander Glenn, who, by the way, still carries a pager around. I thought they'd all gone since the 90s, but apparently not. Now, make sure you listen next month because... Glenn's promised to give us a tour around the fire station. Next, grab your gardening gloves. We're going to find out what we should be doing in the garden at this time of year. We're back with Warren Reeves, who's from the Ricelip Horticultural Society. Hi, Warren. Hello there. Now, first of all, I think we mentioned in our last podcast that you were having an exhibition, uh, the first since COVID in, in Ricelip. How did that all go? Absolutely fantastic, actually. We didn't know what to expect regarding numbers. We were actually very surprised how many people attended. We thought people might still be a little bit cautious or careful of what they attend and go to. I would say we have more visitors at our show than perhaps we have in the last 10, 15, 20 years. I think the attraction was the pins on the lawn outside the back of the Great Barn in Ricelip, probably. We ran out of everything. Of course, we restocked. Our estimate was to supply X, Y, Z, and we ended up supplying twice as much. The exhibition itself had quite a few entries. I would say 250 different entries and an amazing section on what people had done during lockdown. Arts and craft, designing, painting things, knitting, building things. So much display from people that had done things in lockdown, and they came with them displayed them for the day in the barn lots of great great feedback on that we awarded medals and cups at the end of it is great and um it was a great success our next show will be in the spring next year 2022 all being well we'll watch out for that and i gather you had a, uh, a talk last night apples and pears we did we had a talk last night by a gentleman who's a judge at the royal horticultural society and many other societies on uh, fruit. Jerry Edwards, his name is, and he spoke last night on growing apples and pears in your garden. Fantastic talk, great pictures. He actually brought along hundreds and hundreds of different apples to display and to, to purchase. Lots of people bought pears and apples last night that he grew. So interesting to hear about so many varieties of apples and pears, which ones come early, mid season, and then late fruiters as well. And what varieties are best for the garden? and how to grow them, the different sizes. You can have pixie dwarf trees. You can have great big trees. Traditionally, as a child, I remember my grandmother had a huge tree in the garden that supplied, which seemed like thousands of apples every summer. Those are sort of out of fashion now, those sort of trees, apparently, the old Victorian apple trees. People are growing smaller things. Obviously, gardens are getting smaller. People have got less time to manage things. So people are growing the dwarf versions of varieties, which give plenty of fruit, but they're growing smaller varieties for smaller gardens. And even people are growing some fruit trees in pots as well now. So lots of changes, but it was great. It's a fantastic talk. We've got two more talks coming up in November and December. 
And then going forward um, in the garden, obviously we're now in definitely in autumn. I'm never sure whether to cut my grass or not at this time of year. What okay, should we be doing so in the garden? You talk about grass. So for something I was going to mention, actually, we all come to the end of our cutting of grass at this time of year, and we think it's the last cut, and then all of a sudden it warms up and the grass grows again and you're out there again. The last cut of the season should be slightly longer if you can adjust your lawnmower Leave it just slightly longer, more protection for the winter, so you're not doing like a a really close to the ground cut. You're leaving a longer grass for the winter. Tidy the edges up, and then I recommend giving it an autumn feed. You can purchase from the garden centres or DIY shops, you can purchase a feed for the grass, which is actually called autumn feed. It basically contains the ingredients that stop the growth and strengthen the roots for the winter. It gives the grass strong roots to cope through the winter and hold it fast, ready for next year. It kills the moss as well, if there's any moss in the lawn and, and weeds. And then leave it. Don't walk on it. Don't do anything with it, especially if you get a heavy frost in the winter or snow or it's icy and very cold and frozen. Do not walk on your lawn, otherwise you'll damage the grass. Continue deadheading everything. Agapanthus, now if you haven't deadheaded them, you'll notice the flowers have gone to seed. Big heavy seed pods hanging on the end of the agapanthus. Cut those back like I told you last month as well. Cut those back down to as low as you can go. And anything else you need to deadhead, roses, all your other plants that are finished, deadhead them or cut them back if they're perennials and you can cut them down to the ground if they need that. But you need to tidy up the garden. Get rid of all falling leaves now. Every week or so, just rake those fallen leaves up because otherwise what happens is slugs and snails will harbour in them. They'll start hiding away for the winter and then you'll have a, a nightmare in the spring. So get rid of all the rubbish around the garden. Start planting your bulbs. Some bulbs you can put in. Alliums are great. Put them in the ground. Narcissa, your daffodils, your tulips, pots as well. You can get ready your tulips and daffodils in pots and things. Get them planted. If you're putting in bulbs in pots, it's best to put some chicken wire over the top. Otherwise, you'll find in a week or two's time, they've disappeared because the squirrels have dug them up. Pruning things such as roses and wisteria and anything that's gone leggy, just tidy it up. You don't need to do a heavy prune on wisteria and roses, maybe until February, but just tidy it up because what will happen if we have some heavy wind in the winter, those big strappy long stems and things can start flashing around and banging around and it will damage them. So just cut them back, tidy them up so no wind can start knocking things about in the winter. And then mulch. If you mulch your garden, mulch your soil with mushroom compost, horse horse manure, or a mulching product, it stops any bacterias, diseases, and also slugs and snails, keeps them at bay. And it's a good idea to mulch, but be generous. Mulch four to five inches deep. You can put over all your garden borders, The worms will work it through the winter. The worms take the mulch into the soil. So it's a good idea to mulch. Put some fish blood and bone around the borders as well, uh, just with your hands around the borders on on the um, perennials and things. So in the spring, they've got a good chance and a good early start to come through. That's great. Thanks, Warren. And give us a uh, refresh on the website again for the Ricelip Horticultural Society. Yes, it's ricelibhorticultural.org. Dot UK. That's dot .org. Dot UK. Ricelip Horticultural. On there, you can actually join the society. It's a, it's a very small fee. It's seven pounds a year, and then you'll receive all the emails and updates of all our shows, our talks, our events. We're going to be doing an outing next year. We're going to be going to Great Dixter, which is a fantastic house and gardens. Used to be owned by the late Sir Christopher Lloyd. And we're going to Merriment's Gardens and Nursery next year. We're going to have a day trip. But that will be open and available to members of the society. And you can join up online, as I said. But we'll be running a coach trip next year. So you get the emails of all our events and shows and talks and everything. That's all online. And that's all for this month's Uxbridge FM podcast. To get in touch, email studio at uxbridgefm.co.uk. Check out the website, uxbridgefm.co.uk, where there's more local content. Join us on Facebook and Twitter, just search Uxbridge FM. And if you're listening on a podcast app, do subscribe. Thanks to our guests and to Chris Allen for helping out and to local musician Luke Nieri for the music. We'll be back next month 
Talk to you then. 